Good morning. morning. How's everyone today? Man, day after week, weekend after Thanksgiving. It's good to be here today. For those of you who know me, my name's Gary, and I'm on staff at Calvary. I've uh, had the honor of being here, and as Zach steps out on vacation, he asked me to come and share with you what God has been teaching me through this, uh, this time in our study through the book of Revelation. I think for the last few months as a church, we've been working through this book, and I've been personally encouraged as we've embarked on this study, and I've been thankful that I've gotten to grow in my understanding of what God has for us and has been teaching us throughout his word. I love in the first part of Revelation that there's a special blessing for all those who read this book, who understand it, and who apply it to their lives. And so that's our challenge this morning, is that we would be blessed by the reading of God's word that we would have a deeper understanding in it and we try to apply it to our lives because I think it's important as we study this book that we would get a better understanding of what the end times looks like and what it looks like for, for what, when Christ returns. And I think as I've come and studied and just been trying to have a better understanding even what to share with you this morning, I've really had to take some of my um, past understandings and um, things that I was taught to be able to communicate this, um, the truth that's in the book of Revelation to us today. I bring some of my own baggage, some own truths. I, I probably landed more on the side of left behind um, as a young kid. I, I grew up at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and so that was a big part of what was happening there. And so I have that as a young theologian is understanding, okay, this is what it is. And then as I have grown in my understanding, I want to make sure I come to the text with the correct lens to help us understand what is it in here for me today, because I truly believe the book of Revelation isn't just about what's to come, but I also believe it's for what is in store for us today and how it helps us to conform to the likeness of Christ and how it helps us prepare for Jesus's personal, bodily, glorious return for his bride. And no one knows the day or the hour, but it's our responsibility to be ready. That's what Matthew 24 teaches us, is therefore stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at the hour that you do not expect. As we read the text, as we get in the book of Revelation, my desire and my heart is to help us to be ready. And so here we are as we've worked our way through. We're getting close to the end. Actually, here in in Revelation 18 is what we're going to be looking at today. We're kind of at the end of the judgments. I saw this earlier this week, and I want to help you see some truths that I learned that maybe helps outline the book of Revelation in an easy way. So just think about this, chapters 1 through 3, God speaks to the church that's in the city. So the first three chapters are kind of a a report card of what is happening. There's seven letters to seven churches instructing them and correcting the churches and the ways that they are succeeding and the ways that they maybe need to improve on how they live their life. Each of these Breakdowns has a vision that comes from Jesus as well. And this vision is the glorified Jesus standing in the midst of the seven gold lampstands, the seven churches. And so that's kind of the first section is like, this is when God speaks to the church in the city. Chapters 4 through 18 is God judges the great city. It has a vision of Jesus in 5, uh, 6 through 7. The lamb is slain. It's seated on the throne. He's worthy of our worship. And the judgments are going to be poured out for the next 14 chapters. So if you are exhausted about all these judgments are coming over the last two months, this is the last one. It's going to turn next week. And so chapters 19, 19 through 22, it's God redeems the holy city. So God speaks to the church in the city is the first three chapters. God judges the great city or Babylon. That's chapters four through 18. And then chapters 19 19 through 22 is God redeems the holy series. So, So there's a little bit of hope as we come into the last few weeks here in December, getting to the end and the judgments will be over after today. 
Now, chapter 17 was an important chapter, and Zach did a really great job helping us understand the great prostitute who was seated on many waters. This woman was beautiful, according to John, and, the, and he paints a picture of her that she was adored with um, purple and scarlet, and she had gold and jewels and pearls, and on her was written the name Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of all prostitutes and earth abominations. And Zach helped us understand the different views and understanding this text and painting a picture that Babylon the Great is in relationship with the beast and making war against the things of God that are in opposition to the holiness of God. I thought this definition that Zach kind of left us with was really important. He said that Satan... Uh, has, is, and will use existing powers opposed to God, enticing people to find fulfillment apart from him. This is who he said the woman was, this is the great Babylon is, is that Satan has, is, and will use existing powers or nations opposed to God, enticing people to find fulfillment apart from them. That's kind of the definition of Babylon is that, that it's this great empire that is drawing people away from God. Babylon is the representation of a place that is in opposition to the things of God. One commentator wrote that Babylon is the personification of, of evil. Even at the end of human history, it will still represent the worst of the worst. It has godless leadership. It's egotistical. It's vain. It's incredibly pure. It will mock the God of Israel, and it will be the wickedness of all wickedness. Babylon was known for its demonic influences, the infiltration of the education system, and the state-sponsored religion was satanic with a dose of astrology and occult practices, which led to the culture that was hostile to the things of God, and God's people were persecuted in a variety of different ways. And we see that throughout the story of Babylon, especially when we're really kind of first introduced to it at its peak, it's Babylon. Babylon's physical peak in the book of Daniel. Religious Babylon, as we saw in chapter 19, lures nations into spiritual drunkenness and fornication with false gods. And we will see in chapter 18, commercial Babylon seduces an unbelieving world into a materialistic stupor so that people of this world will become drunk with passion because of their relationship with Babylon. Babylon is enticing. It draws people in. And friends, we need to be on guard not to be seduced by Babylon. That is what hopefully we will see this morning is that those who are in relationship with Babylon um, want more and more of it. And those who are opposed to it want nothing to do with it. My fear is that many of us unknowingly are Hearts are tied to the things of Babylon. And so as we get ready for this morning, I think it's important to understand that there are, there are the context of what's going on. And there are going to be two types of individuals that we're going to see in chapter 18. But if you have your Bible, let's open up to Revelation chapter 18, verse 1. It says this, After I saw... Another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of her passion, of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed um, immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from her power of her luxurious living. Wow. Here's what's happening in this point is, is an angel with authority is announcing, it's a messenger saying that Babylon has fallen. The things that have been built upon Babylon are going to be done. 
done. That is the hope that we have that one day Babylon will be destroyed. And here at this point, the climax is fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, for unclean spirits, for unclean burns, for unclean and detestable beasts, for all the nations have become drunk with her passions. People are following her, who are living with her. The nations in the world have indulged indulged with her passions, her immorality. Kings have followed her way. Business owners have, give, have grown rich off of her. And people are making loads and loads of money off the depravity of the nation. When we read these lines, at least for me, I start to look around and wonder, am I living in a state like that today? Where rulers are corrupt where people are falling away from the things of God, where money is being made off of people and people are being oppressed in the midst of that. And so even in this, this is kind of a telling statement that I found. This past week, many of us celebrated Thanksgiving. For some of us, it is a favorite holiday of the year. We get to gather with family and friends. We get to eat really well, maybe watch some football, enjoy the community of loved ones, maybe hopefully take a nap. According to the research that I kind of did, Thanksgiving started in 1621 when the pilgrims celebrated with the Native Americans an autumn harvest. For more than two centuries, individual states and colonies celebrated Thanksgiving. But in 1863, President Abraham Lincoln established Thanksgiving Day in November as a national holiday. But in 1789, George Washington wrote a Thanksgiving proclamation where he assigned Thursday, the 26th of November, to be devoted to giving thanks to God. And here's his proclamation. It was fascinating for me to read. It says this, and I'll just read parts of it. Where, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of the Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and to humbly to implore His protection and favor. Uh, and so the United States, a day of public thanksgiving and prayer will be observed by the acknowledging with grateful hearts with the many signal favors of the Almighty, especially by affording them the opportunity to peacefully establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. And so he establishes this date so that they can give thanks to the Lord. And then it says this, then many we that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care and protection of the people of this country to become a nation. And then later on he says, and also that we may unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplication to the great Lord and ruler of the nations and beseech him to pardon our nation and other transgressions. It's fascinating to think about our founding fathers had this deep understanding that God Almighty was in control of all things. And so I was thinking through this over the last few days, and I said, I wonder if our White House today sent out another proclamation about Thanksgiving this year. And they did. And I read through it, and there was no mention of God in it. But this is what it did say. This Thanksgiving, we are grateful for our nation and our incredible soul of America. May we all remember that we are the United States of America. There is nothing beyond our capacity if we do it together. And I'm thinking, look at where we've come from, where it was all about giving thanks to God Almighty to, hey, if we stay together, look at how great we can become. And then I think back to like Daniel 4, when King Nebuchadnezzar steps out onto the balcony and he looks out and he says, look at what I have built. Whew, I get a little bit nervous, friends. And I don't know if that's the same for you, but you, you kind of begin to look up and maybe over time I didn't notice what I was living in because I was comfortable. And I think the enemy does an incredible job of helping us just enjoy the circumstances that we're living in. But when I get above the clouds a little bit, little bit I wonder if we're living in a modern day 
Babylon, and we don't even know it. We've become numb to the way the enemy has infiltrated our culture and is leading us to live a life that maybe unintentionally is in rebellion against God. So then we go back to Revelation 18.4. It says this, Then I heard another voice say from heaven, from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crime. When I think of this, her sins have been piled up to heaven. I think back to kind of the first introduction we get of Babylon, right? In the Tower of Babylon, where the people in Genesis 11, they kind of said, we want to build a tower in our city that will reach the heavens and make a name for ourselves so the whole earth will know our name, right? And so then I love how the scripture kind of points back to that. And so her sins are going to be as high as the heavens. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her double proportion for her own cup. The consequences the punishment is going to be great for Babylon. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as a queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. The mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Friends, Babylon will crumble and the Lord will judge. But four, to me, is one of these pivotal verses that I think is important for us to look at. It says this, it says, come out of her, my people. There's a call for you and I to recognize where we are living and to come out of Babylon, that we would not find fulfillment in opposition to God, that we would leave this, that, that we would move away from the things that are mentioned here. It, it reminds me kind of a little bit of what it says in 1 John uh, or 1 John 2, 15 through 17, it says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The language is strong in this text. Do not love the world or anything in the world. What is it you put your time to, your energy towards? What are you spending your money on? What are you focusing on? Like well, These are the things that we want to make sure are the things of God. Colossians 3 says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. We want to focus our mind and our hearts of things from above. We want to place our hope in the things of God, not in the things of this world. And when I think of myself and my own personal time, I get convicted of what I am spending my time to. What am I allowing my heart to go, go towards? Where have I spent my time? What things do I know way too much about that are temporary, that are things of this world, instead of consuming the things of the Lord and allowing his word to penetrate my life and to guide and direct me. We don't want to miss out on these things. We want to be connected to the things of God. I think even as the warnings came out to the churches in Revelation 2, remember it says, don't lose your first love. Like that was one of the warnings that was given to us is that we wouldn't forget about our first love to the kingdom. And it's so easy for us to get distracted and love the things of this world. In chapter three, it says, you are neither hot nor cord, no co nor cold. You are worthless to me. And so I spit you out. But behold, I stand at the door and knock. And here it is today in Revelation 18. There's a call for those to come out of Babylon, to not sit in her sin, to, to step out and let your heart be focused on the things 
of the Lord. That's what Matthew 6 kind of talks about as well. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Where is your heart? And I think that's what we see in the two people that we're going to look at as we continue to look at the rest of Revelation. Is what is your heart connected to? It is it connected to the things of this world or is it connected to the things of God? You need to come out of idolatry. You need to disassociate, disassociate with the things of Babylon. You do not want to compromise yourself or indulge yourself in the things of this world. We sang earlier, you know, I offer all of my heart to you, O Lord. I give you everything. That wants to be our posture. And why? Is because the consequences are great. And that's what we see is that one day doom and destruction is coming to the Babylon. So there are two types of people that I want to look at as we kind of continue our way through chapter 18. We're going to skip on down to 18 verse 9. It says this, the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and live in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. That's when Babylon is destroyed. They will stand far off in fear and torment and say, Alas, alas, the great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. It seems like judgment, destruction, and doom is going to come quickly to the people and look at what we see here, is the kings are weeping. They've lost their influence. They've lost their authority. They have lost their position that they love. And then in 11, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of um, scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine uh, flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and, slave, that, and slaves. That is human souls. I mean, these merchants have all these um, tr- uh, Articles, they have all these things that are beautiful, the, these things that people want and desire. And it even says, and they're even building them off of human slaves. That's how they're getting these things. And so when they lose, when Babylon is destruction and all this is gone, they mourn, they weep. And then in 15, the merchants of the wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. So, the, so we have the kings who weep. We have the merchants who are weeping. We have the ones who are selling are weeping. They're sad because their life, what they built their hearts on, is destroyed and gone. And so they no longer see any hope because their hope was built on things that do not last. And then even in 17, and all the shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and all those who in trade is on the sea stood far off and cried aloud as they small saw the smoke from their burning. So there's a group of people who are weeping when Babylon is destroyed. Their hearts were entangled with the things of this world. And now that they are gone, there is sorrow, there is mourning, there is weeping, there is sadness. Friends, what would it be like if you lost everything? What if one day you woke up and your 401k was wiped out? Would you mourn? Would you be destroyed? Because when Babylon is destroyed, here's what the people of God do in verse Verse 20, they rejoice over her, O heaven, and all you saints and apostles and and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. 
See, I think it depends on what our heart is tied up into. Are we tied up into the things of this world? Are we tied up into the things of God? Because if we're tied up in the things of this world, when we lose these things, when we lose our comfort, when we lose our security, when we lose the hope that we've placed in things of this world, our hearts will be saddened. But when our trust and our hope are in the things of God, these things do not impact us because our heart is resting in the things of the Lord. When the world comes crashing down, will you be crushed? Will you curse God? Will you question God? Or will you turn and be strengthened in the Lord and rejoice? Will you turn to the promises of God? Will you remind yourself of passages like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Now, if you're like me, like this just takes a while to digest and to think about. Because unfortunately, I think there are times when I am really caught up in the things of this world. And I struggle with, just even as we prepare for Christmas, right? And you know, there's times people are like, hey, can you give me your list so I can go shopping and get you all these gifts? You know, we just experienced, what was it? Black Friday and then Small Business Saturday. I guess there's Sabbath Rest Sunday. I don't know. And then Cyber Monday, right? It's all this consumption that is expected to have this time of year. And who's saying, who's preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ? Who's saying, we need to take time and remember that Christ is at the center of this time. That's what we want about. We want to be about the Lord and letting him guide and direct our lives in the midst of everything that is happening. That's what we want to be thinking about. We want to be thinking about the things of God. And because I've been wrestling with this pastor and I've been trying to figure out what does it look like for us to live in Babylon today? And I honestly don't fully know. Because I think it, we're so immersed in it, it's so hard for us. But I want to give kind of three ideas that maybe would help us live as citizens of heaven and not citizens of this world. And so this is how we come out of Babylon. Because that's the, that was the cry, right? Come out of her. Yes, you be immersed in her. So number one is this. It's set your focus on things from above, not on earthly things. And I read this verse earlier. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, above, not on earthly things. I think it's easy to get caught up in the busyness of this time of year and everything that is going on. I think it's easy to forget about why we celebrate Christmas. And so I think if we begin to set our eyes and our hearts and our minds on things from above and not on things of this world, it will allow us to, to be removed from the corruption of Babylon. The heart of Advent, the, that video was shared earlier. This was start out of kind of that idea many, many years ago at Calvary where we said, hey, we want to spend less so we can give, or give more so we can worship fully. That was the heart behind it because we saw so much consumption going to so many things that we wanted to be a positive impact in our community and our culture. We said, how as a church can we encourage our people to not get caught up in the consumption and the commercialism of what is happening in the day? And so we maybe spend a little guess, less, give one less gift, have one more thing. Or maybe you say, hey, I would love for you to donate on my behalf. And then we want to we wanna give more of our time, our energy, our hearts to worship the Lord fully. And that's where the heart of Advent started many years ago. And it's morphed over time. There were times that we, we said, let's, let's help with the water crisis going on in the, in the world. There were other things that we said, this is what's happening in our world. And so this year, it's about attainable housing. That's just kind of the thing that God's placed on our heart as a church, that we want to come alongside that issue that it's happening. But the whole desire was we want to set our hearts on the things above, not on things of this world. We want to set our hearts on things that are going to last forever, not that are going to be temporary. Number two is this, is set your focus on doing God's will, not on pleasing others. 
Romans 12, 1, 2 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is a constant battle that we all have to do daily, is to seek the Lord first in all we do. To not be caught up in the things of this world, but have our minds be in line with the things of God. And to be continually transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is what we want. We want to set our focus on God's will, not on pleasing others. Because it's so easy to look at our friends and our peers and our family members. And I want to do things for them to make them happy. Instead of saying, Lord, take all of me. I want to worship you fully. Whatever you need me to do, I want to set my mind and my heart on doing your will to bring you honor and worship. And the third thing is this, is set your focus on remaining faithful to the Lord in a faithless society. A few months ago, we did a whole study on the life and person of Daniel and just what does it look like to live in the midst of Babylon and to thrive I think that's a really important thing to think about is if you want some, just go back and listen to that six-week series that we did. What does it look like to thrive in Babylon? Is to live like Daniel. But I was also thinking about Hebrews 11 and God's hall of faith and all these incredible individuals who remained faithful in their lives. They were heroes of the faith. faith. They, they are remembered throughout Scripture and all they did for the kingdom of God. What I really appreciate is at that end of the chapter, it kind of leaves the few little paragraphs that aren't about all these people who had this great life and what we remember. You know, like Daniel who shut the the mouths of the lion or, or David who became this incredible leader. But there's some other unnamed people who were faithful to the very end. And it says this, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goat, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the deserts and the mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us. So it doesn't always end up well for us in this age, but we are not living for this moment. We are living as citizens of heaven for a future glory and the promise that Jesus is coming back for his church one day. We want to remain faithful to the end. We want to come out of Babylon. We want to be able to rejoice when Babylon falls. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for your word and the truth that's in it. Father, I pray that it would penetrate our hearts and that our hearts would see that it's so easy for us to be lured away by the things of this world, Lord. But I pray for us as a church that we would really desire the things of you, that we would set our minds and our focus on the things of you, that we would have a deep desire to live out your truths and your will. And Lord, that we as a church would remain faithful, as we as a people would remain faithful in a faithless society, Lord. We love you in your name. Amen.